BMW says M is the most powerful letter in the world, but adding three extra letters makes it much more potent. C, S, L. Those letters were affixed to the 3 litre CSL soon after BMW's M or motorsport division was founded 50 years ago, before its cars were even badged M. The CSL got off to a flying start as well, winning the 1973 European Touring Car Championship and laying the groundwork for the M road cars we know today. But until now, BMW has only dusted off the CSL suffix once since, and that was for the 2003 E46 M3 CSL, and that car's now revered as one of the best M cars of all time. So while that CSL name is powerful, it carries with it a ton of responsibility. But now, to celebrate its 50th anniversary, BMW M is facing up to that pressure with the M4 CSL. Just a thousand will be built in total, and only a hundred are coming to the UK. And that makes it the rarest CSL of all. Now I'll admit to some unprofessional bias here, I'm a lifelong M fan, I owned an E36 M3 for 18 years and gave up my own CSL track treatment, and while I didn't get on with the previous M4, I clicked with a new one straight away. So I really, really want this car to be good. Now there's a load of stuff to talk about here, but I really want to focus on weight to start off with because that's what this car's all about. And after all, CSL originally translated as Coupe Sport Lightweight. BMW now says it's competition sport lightweight, presumably to give them more scope for other models, but please, please, please don't do an SUV BMW. So CSL, Coupe Sport Lightweight or competition sport lightweight. They have saved a hundred kilos from this car. So that's a little less than the original, well, the E46 M3 CSL, which was 110 kilo saving. And this is a heavier overall car as well so it's a smaller percentage but nonetheless 100 kilos is still a significant amount and it weighs 1625 kilos din which is still quite a heavy car but nonetheless 100 kilos very well done bmw so to do that we've got carbon fiber components so as well as the, the carbon fiber roof which is standard on the m4 we have got carbon fiber bonnet and the boot lid, which is swept up in a ducktail style, like in a homage to the original E46 M3 CSL. Now that saves 11 kilos. A few other bits and pieces here and there, including that monster kidney grill, that's a bit lighter, a half a kilo lighter, a bit more from the rear lights. And they've also saved 21 kilos from this area as well. So we've got carbon ceramic brakes. They're normally an option on the M4, but the standard here, we've got lightweight hollow wheels. And we've still got the same tire size. It's a monster 275 section at the front, 285s at the back. And, and just to note as well, we are on the Michelin Pilot Sport 4S tires, not the Cup 2Rs that they did the Nürburgring time on. And uh, they've also got lightweight spring struts apparently, and um, a few other bits and bobs. That saves 21 kilos. And at the back, we've got the titanium exhaust silencer. That saves 4.3 kilos. And while we're around here, you can probably see the ducktail spoiler as well, like the E46 M3 CSL. No figures on downforce though, by the way. Now, if we take a look inside, there's a load more weight saving measures in here. So lightweight carbon fiber bucket seats. Well, actually our car gets another optional set of carbon bucket seats like you can get in the M4, a little bit more luxurious. They've got electric adjustment, but no rear seat is standard, that saves another 21 kilos. And BMW says there's lightweight soundproofing, so that's 15 kilos. But BMW has saved a little bit of weight off the climate control system, but crucially, it's still in there, as is the infotainment system. And I know it's a little bit perverse when you're trying to save bits and pieces of little kilos and grams here and there, but it reminds me of a conversation I had with Gerhard Richter, the old M Division boss, back in 2007. And they'd just done, or a few years ago, they'd done the M3 CSL, and they had an internal sweepstake. If they could guess, how many customers would add back in the air con and the stereo system, which was optional on that car. And Richter said he thought it would be 50%, but actually in the end, 85% of customers added it back in. So it just goes to show you, it is what customers want. Before we get into more spec, let's get out on the road and see how the M4 CSL feels to drive. course what every customer wants is a great M division engine and this one is a three litre twin turbo straight six and my god this thing can really kick 
It's got 40 brake horsepower, extra at 542 brake horsepower. It's really responsive. I think it does feel extra responsive versus even the standard car, which is highly responsive, presumably because it's got those you know, 100 kilos fewer. It's got a lovely reach as well, just like the standard car has, right up to 7,200 RPM. But it's the bit in the middle, the torque, that I think is interesting because officially it's the same figure, 479 pound-foot of torque from 2,750 RPM. There is a little bit more reach on that. It goes up about 400 RPM higher as a peak. But my sense is that there's a lot more torque in this car and presumably that is because you've got the 100 kilos fewer it's got less to lug around now it is a bit of a mixed blessing i think oh, it's really chewing at those tires it is a bit of a mixed blessing because you know while you've got that really meaty mid-range and, and while you can use all the revs on a straight road when you're doing you know on a road like this that's twisty you're short shifting more it sort of emphasizes more of a diesel-y kind of character and you know i think that does detract from the interaction in some ways the other thing we've got is rear wheel drive so it's not the m x drive version it's purely rear wheel drive and interestingly we've got the eight speed auto transmission so they could have gone for the manual that's available in other markets not the uk to save more weight but presumably this is the way to kind of get round the ring fastest for that Nürburgring 7 minute 20 time they did. And do you know what? It really does punch. It's only a regular auto. I say only, but it has, it's a pretty ferocious kind of gearbox, really. When you dial it right up to the third setting, it really punches. And I think they're trying to make a point in that, you know, it's not a dual clutch gearbox, but it can still be pretty direct and very, very quick. Now again, a little bit like the torque, the interesting thing with the gearbox is there's no kind of claims for recalibrated shifts or, or more sort of urgent shifts, but it feels like they're more urgent to me. And I don't know if that's because we've got solidly mounted um, a rear axle, solid mounted rear axle and stiffer engine mounts. So there's less slack in the drive line perhaps and, and you're kind of feeling that sort of the punch of the gear shift a bit more abruptly. And to the extent that I've wound it down from the third setting to the second one, it was interesting jumping in this car straight away and I drove it around town initially and I actually quite liked it around town you know it could be a gnarly old thing but but while it's stiff and it, it feels stiff and its body structure and it, its suspension has got a decent amount of compliance the steering is really really nice and it's got this kind of urgency but effortlessness to it as you just sort of cruise about but clearly it really comes into its own when you up the pace so the steering it's fantastic on this car. It's really, really accurate. It's got a nice, quite kind of light weighting. So, and it responds every kind of little movement is doing something. So it's reacting really quickly, really sharply, really feels all connected on the front end. Now the chassis is lowered eight mil. There's uh, different springs, helper springs as well for when it gets into real sort of compression, different anti-roll bars, and it all adds up. Wow. The other thing to say, you know, with this chassis, it feels very, very light and on its toes. You know, I said it was 1625 kilos before, but there's no way it feels that heavy. It definitely has a very nimble, agile feel to it. And I think part of that has got to be the unsprung weight with the carbon ceramic brakes and, and the, uh, the lighter alloy wheels as well. It's a very rear biased feeling car, this. I know it's obvious because it's rear wheel drive, but you're constantly getting that kind of thump and mid-range pushing you through corners. And it, I wouldn't call it intimidating. Maybe it is a little bit intimidating at first because you feel like you've got a, a big old sort of wump coming into the back wheels, but it has got really good traction. We're on 4S tires, so not the, the kind of maximum Cup 2Rs, which I reckon this car's gonna feel so precise on those tyres, but we've got 4S tyres on, and it does really well actually at putting down the power. <laughs> it's chewing a little bit there and, and sort of straining, but for how much is going on here with a 479 pound foot of torque, it is actually really, really impressive. Now you can go up on the variable traction control system through 10 different settings. That works really well, but it's still, even when you turn everything off in the dry, it has got a lot of traction to get all that down. 
remove the rear seats. The CSL has no rear seats, so as you get up to speed, you do get quite a lot of road noise. So that's one thing, you know, clearly it's a hardcore track car, but you are sort of losing that bit of refinement as much as you've got a very supple ride. It is uh, pretty loud in the back there. The way this car just flows down this road, it's really impressive. It's, it's got that compliance, but there is feel through the steering. It's got a very, very strong front end. So it just all combines to give you confidence together with that traction. The response is really impressive. Mostly here, I am short shifting on these roads and that, you know, I would prefer to have a bit more, kind of go up to the top of the revs. Even then putting it in third gear, it's still soaked all that up. So it is a very, very competent chassis. This nice and reactive, but very secure as well. Wow, it has got some go, this thing. Good as the M4 CSL is, it does carry a huge premium of almost £50,000 over the standard M4 competition at £128,820. And that puts it right into the orbit of another two seat rear wheel drive German icon, the 911 GT3. Yeah, wow. This is the GT3, but it's a GT3 Touring. So it's interesting compared with the M4 CSL, which kind of dials up the aggression of the M4 to the max. The Touring kind of makes the GT3 a little bit more palatable for the road. Now the things that we've got that are the same, we've got a four litre flat six naturally aspirated engine. We've got a choice of manual or PDK dual clutch gearboxes. So this one gets the manual and that's 50% of sales of the Touring at the minute. We've got the same rear wheel steering, apparently the same springs and dampers. We've got a choice of cast iron brakes or carbon ceramic optionally. So this one's cast iron spec. Uh, and the things that are different, uh, we've not got the uh, huge swan neck rear wing that makes it look like an RSR race car. So much more subtle. It has a, a wing that pops up at speed instead and, and compensates for some of that lost downforce. Slightly subtler uh, appearance including the the front end hasn't got the contrast black and inside we've got more leather just for a generally plusher feel now, it's easy to think of the touring as kind of a new addition to the 911 lineup but actually it's something that dates right back to the 2.7 rs of 1973. porsche was racing its rs race cars you wanted to make them as light as possible and homologate them at that that way so it's a little bit of a cheat to add in a more luxurious interior as an option for customers for road use and that's what they did they put the 2.4s interior back in and and this car that kind of riffs on that with a bit more extra luxury now it's interesting actually to compare the evolution of these two engines between the csl and the gt3 you know if you look back 20 years ago the M3 CSL made about 360 brake horsepower and the GT3 did as well, depending on which 996 you're talking about, but both about 360. And the evolution since then has been really quite different. While BMW has added twin turbos to its straight six engine to get to 542 brake horsepower, it's done that and it has lost the character of that fizzy M division straight six. Porsche has kind of continually evolved this flat six, this naturally aspirated engine, only increased it by 400 cc and yet it's still really in the ballpark with 503 brake horsepower plus it rips all the way out to 9,000 rpm it's an astonishing engine wow I mean, the other thing this engine's got gasoline particulate filters on it now which is supposed to muffle it but it still sounds amazing i mean for the video i've got the exhaust switched to its louder setting but actually I'm a little bit self-conscious because it does sound like there's a race car running around. It sounds absolutely amazing. It made the exhaust lighter as well, despite having the, uh, the gasoline particulate filters in there. And, you know, just the soundtrack, the way it sounds like a race car, it is so invigorating, this engine. So the big difference between these two engines, as well as the noise, is the torque, though. So the, the BMW hits really hard with 479 pound foot of torque, and that's from 2750 RPM. The Porsche is 347 pound foot, so much, much lower. 
but they, it doesn't come in till 6.1, so that's almost where the BMW is making its peak power, so it's a huge difference. Now, in some ways, that's a win on paper for the BMW, but I personally, I really like having torque put up on a high shelf, so you've got to really work for it, and it just means that the, the rear tyres aren't getting overwhelmed, and, and when you're uncorking that, that performance, you're doing it with real intent. Of course, the other difference is with the gearbox, so you can get a manual gearbox with this car. 50% of customers do, and I really think, you know, this is the way that I would spec my car. I love the short throw, how precise it is, the tactility and involvement of it. Clutch is really nicely weighted and you can heel and toe, you can flip the throttle, all that stuff. And I know it sounds a little bit overindulgent sometimes, but I do think that involve, it adds to the involvement and, and, and that just really makes this car more special for me. Much as I think PDK is absolutely fantastic. Now with the manual you do lose half a second off the 0 to 60 time, so it's 3.9 seconds, so it's a big, big drop. Top speed goes up a little bit to 199 miles an hour, but to be honest, I don't care about those figures at all. It's the bit in the middle that's important. So this engine then, let's just see if we can wind this out somewhere. So 2,000 RPM. <laughs> I think that was almost the full 9,000 RPM. It sounded absolutely insane. Still had a little bit of headroom up there. So, you know, I think it's interesting context is that this car's 503 brake horsepower. It's only 10% or, or 10 PS or 10 brake horsepower more than its predecessor. But it's just, you know, it's great that Porsche is sticking with this and, and not, you know, not going turbo because you just get that response and that reach and that power band and it's just, it, it really makes this car. Now the other thing, this, this car weighs 1,418 kilos versus the, the BMW at 1,625, so it's a lot lighter as well. So when you factor in power to weight, the Porsche is a long way or a decent way ahead of the BMW, it turns the tables. And I think the context is interesting these days as well, isn't it? When we've got 700 plus supercars becoming kind of normal and 503 brake horsepower can seem a little bit limp, but honestly, when you're strapped into this thing and you're winding it out to 9,000 RPM, it's absolutely ferocious. And I can't really imagine wanting any more than this. It's just absolutely amazing. <laughs> Now, the other thing we need to talk about is the suspension. So it's double wishbone at the front, derived from the 911 RSR race car, obviously being around decades before that. My RX-8 has got that as well, but it does make a big difference here. It, it keeps the cornering nice and flat. The front end is so precise on this car, it really turns in nice. You've already got that lack of weight from the engine being at the back, but combined with that double wishbone, it just keeps it really nice and pure. I mean, if anything, I would say it's there's a slightly sterile feel because it's just less perturbed by bumps and things. It's still communicating, it's still talking to you, but it's, it is a more sterile, kind of pure, consistent feel. Now, people have said this ride can feel quite choppy at times vertically and I think you know th there is a little bit of that but I think generally over this rougher section here you can probably see it but I think generally it's still got a lot of compliance to it. it's still very usable and and feels you know it's certainly not going to knock you offline the other thing that's really surprising about this car is just how throttle steerable it is you probably saw it there it will you know it's got P0 Corsa tires on it which I really like but they're very very grippy and it will grip and go and you know ping off down the road but it's still very throttle steerable and adjustable and again that's adding to that interaction and compared with the BMW you know the BMW is more of a hit and this has got something that you can meter in a bit more precisely and, and play with in, a, in, in quite an engaging way in an extremely engaging way. So yeah, it's just the way this car hangs together as a whole, the, the 
suspension, how it's got some compliance to it, the accurate steering, the strong front end, the way you've got that amazing engine and the tactile manual transmission, but you've still got grip to put it all down. And yet, you can play with that balance as well. It's just a beautiful, beautiful package. The GT3 gets off to the best possible start by looking so pure and perfect, just standing still and making the driver feel so comfortable before you've even turned the key. The flat six is mind-blowingly special with its ferocious reach to 9,000 RPM. And of course, it's the GT3's USP. But while it dominates the experience, it doesn't overwhelm it. Everything else is superbly integrated. The steering, the pedal feel, and in particular, how it combines mighty grip and competence with a benign throttle steerable balance that encourages you to really dig in to that performance. It's the winner of this test, and I'll take mine exactly like this one. Touring pack, manual gearbox, and all.